Well, hi everyone. Thanks for watching. Today I'm with Charles Brewer, former IBF super middleweight world champion and an absolute legend of boxing. Uh, Charles, thank you very much for taking the time to have a chat with me today. No problem. Glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, so I mean, starting at the beginning, um, you know, it's, it's a good place to start. Obviously, coming um, out of Philadelphia, uh, which is obviously a famous fighting city, um, were you always interested in, in boxing growing up? Um, was it always, you know, was it your first love as a sport? Or were there other sports that sort of caught your attention first? Well, for the, <laughs> no, <laughs> actually, no, it wasn't. Um, and in fact, I ended up taking up boxing as a result of hmm, the neighborhood I grew up in, <laughs> which, which influenced me to learn how to defend myself, which I had to. Um, no, I wasn't drawn to boxing normally or nationally. I didn't keep up with it. Um, but, I mean, we're talking about a very young age. I'm talking about between the ages of eight and eight and 14 is what I'll give it because um, it was at and during those times uh, when I first went into the gym, which was, at this time is called the 23rd and Police Athletic League, the POW. Um, it was at those times and in those ages at when I very first entered the gym. Um, and I was introducing them boxing. And at first, it seemed sort of kind of fun for me. And I'm, I mean, we're talking about between the ages of eight and 10. Um, so I dabbled and dabbled with it. The police athletic league that I was attending, um, they also had uh, other, thing, other activities you can be in, such as track. Uh, they had basketball. They had table tennis. So boxing was one of the things I was interested in, um, but not committed to it. So I stayed with it for a while, dibbled and dabbled in it. And, and this went on from about the age of eight through probably 12. And for a while, I left it alone. I, you know, I, I, you know, I had, didn't have that much interest in it. At the age of 14, um, a friend of mine from the neighborhood began to uh, go to the gym. And he had come from the gym one day and had told me there was a person he wanted to introduce me to. So I said, oh, okay, cool. You know, and so we ended up going to the gym the next day. And the person that he introduced me to was Bobby Bugalo Watts. And um, from that day forward, um, I began going to the gym and I never looked back. I essentially, the sport of boxing, I fell in love with it. And from that day forward, man, I, I had just been head over heels involved in boxing. So um, it was, I, I guess you can say for me, a complete turnaround for boxing. Um, for me, man, boxing, first and foremost, is, is like this. It's crazy because I tell people this. I'm not an avid boxing fan. But like, I, I love boxing. I love the sport. But I'm not one of them people that I, every single fight, I got I got to be in front of the TV. I got to be at the fight. I remain connected to the sport through some of the names that are in there. And I'm aware of the going on in boxing and who's who and, and who the champions are and so on and so forth. But I'm not only crazy about it. Um, <laughs> During my career, I have been, man, adamantly committed to it. And to me, it was like, I mean, we're talking about around 14, 15 years old, man. And, uh, you know, you're going through um, adolescence and, you know, your, your muscles are beginning to get big. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm starting to like this. I'm, you know, I'm going to the gym and working out. 
my arms are getting big, my legs are getting big. I'm like, oh, I'm getting muscles. I'm feeling good. So um, I was committed to it. And along with that, there was a challenge that boxing presented to me that it was like no other challenge. I mean, I had never um, encompassed a mental challenge, let alone a physical challenge at all in my life to, to that point. Um, for the mere being of me being able to challenge myself to, you know, today I'm doing 100 push-ups tomorrow, I'm going to try and do 150, and now I want to see the end results of it by the end of the month. Let's see how big my body gets. Um, you know, I, I see I'm throwing a punch hard this week. I want to see how hard I'll be able to throw in the month. If I get the same effect when I hit a person with that same shot a month from now. So it, it to me, I mentally became locked and loaded in the sport. And it, that just drove me man, to be the person that I, I had become in the sport of boxing. I loved it. So you, you touched on there, champ, something that I want to go back to. I mean, you, you touched on um, being trained by Bubalu Watts, absolute what? legend of boxing. Um, and I've seen that you, you mentioned before uh, in other interviews that he was like a father figure to you and everything like that. But what was it actually like um, training with him and, and working with him in terms of the whole experience of that? Oh, man. Um, but, well, let me tell you this. When I first started boxing with Boogaloo, because um, he grew up in the same neighborhood I grew up in. Um, and so he knew a lot of the older individuals who lived in the neighborhood that I lived in. Um, my mom knew his family and so on, and his family knew my mom and so on and so forth. My mom told him one day, um, when I was about to go to the gym, and she told him, watch over my son. That was her words directly to him. And he, um, and he told, he said, don't worry about it, Miss Brewer. I, I will take good care of your son. And from that point forward, he actually seemed to be a, and I, I can't, no other way to find it other than being a father figure in the sport of boxing. I mean, he was literally, literally my left hand. You know, he was, he was right there with me all throughout. Um, he was all throughout within the sport and throughout life through the sport of boxing during my entire tenure. So I say to him, you know, Boogaloo, I mean, man, we had to get up and go run, and he was right there with us. You know, uh, the late nights in the gym, through the ups and downs, the ins and outs of boxing and in life unto itself, he was right then and there for me. So, I, you know, I consider him being in the sport of boxing, my father figure. He was right there for us. So that's exactly what he was, man. And, you know, Bugler was a hell of a fighter himself. So I put my absolute trust and awe in him. You know, it wasn't one of those things where um, when it came to the instructions that were being given that I had any doubts at all about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, how I'm doing it, or should I be doing it another way. But I felt very confident in feeling free and executing it just as he instructed because I know that it was coming from a person's mouth who was very wise in, in what he was doing. So I felt good in the instruction that were being given. Now something else here to um, touch on, obviously around, you know, around this sort of timeline. Obviously during your career, you were known as the Hatchet. Um, it's a great boxing name, I think. But I mean, I have to ask, where did that come from? I mean, did did Bugalu give you that name, or or like, I mean, where did it, it start? That, yes, that would be the case. Bugalu definitely he gave me the name, the hatchet. I had a stable mate of mine, who now is actually his son-in-law, William Jones, who he gave the name the Hammer. Um, and so I don't know if Bug had a, 
had to hang up with, with, with garden tools or what, or it was a silent, a violent part about him that we don't know about. But uh, yeah, he gave me the name of the Hatchet. Unfortunately, those kind of names uh, in the sport of boxing, uh, either you're going to end up being the ass end of a joke if you don't live up to it, <laughs> or you're going to have to show up and show out each and every time around to prove that you are the hatchet. And I, I think I did a pretty good job at showing that name fits me perfectly. Well, yeah, I would say so. I would say so. And then, obviously, um, I mean, you turned pro relatively young. Um, and, you know, every time I, I research this, it, it mentions that, you know, your amateur career was, you know, fairly limited in some respects. So I'm going to skip over that to an extent because, like I say, you turned pro fairly young. I mean, what, what was the decision um, behind that? I mean, you know, how, how did it come about turning pro? What sort of inspired you to make that decision, you know, at that age and everything yeah, you like know, that? You know what? It, it had come to a point where um, the 84 Olympics had came in with and that came in 84, and I was pretty much just getting my feet wet with boxing. Um, at that age, I was 14 years old. In the 80 Olympics, I didn't get probably nowhere near close to competing in that. You know, I think the farthest I had gotten was the regional uh, Philadelphia Golden Gloves. That was it. And so I wasn't going to wait another four years to make a decision as to whether or not boxing was going to be a sport slash job slash business slash career that I was going to make an attempt to. So it had come to one day I was in the gym uh, training, and apparently it must have been on both of mine as well because um, at the end of the day, when I was done training, he had uh, he said, "Come here, I want to talk to you." And he said, "I know you guys are getting young, know, getting older, and you know, have you given any thought to possibly turning pro?" So I was like, "I was like, oh, you are talking about the big time?" So he started laughing. I'm like, "Yeah, them gloves are a lot smaller, and we don't wear no headgear either." So he started laughing. And um, he said, well, I'll tell you what, he said, look, he said, give it some thought. You know, he said, you guys are pretty much the top tier in the amateur rankings. I mean, we was whooping ass in Philly, for real. And um, I felt very confident in my skills and abilities. Um, and at that point, I felt as though maybe turning pro would have been a challenge that may have – you know, turn a professional, it may take me to a new level, you know. Maybe I can become somebody that exceeded what Boogaloo had become, you know. And so I said, I'll give some thought, you know, and it didn't take long. Within that week, I was like, okay, make the moves that need to be made. And mentally, I'll do the conditioning part to get set and ready for – whatever challenge that may be coming. And so be it. Uh, we made the arrangements. I made the agreement. And I um, I turned pro. And the rest is history. <laughs> Talk about um, another aspect of that that I know is, uh, is very important to you and also very important to boxing history. Uh, and that's the Blue Horizon. Now, uh, obviously, you made your debut there. Uh, obviously, you were a regular there, and later on, you defended um, your world title there. But I mean, let's talk about the let's talk about the debut, your first fight, and and uh, the, you know the first professional fight that you had. Um, what was it like? How did it go? And in, in that way, what was it like um, fighting at a historic venue like that? Um, first and foremost, it was. Not having actually been exposed to a crowd of that magnitude, um, yeah, you got the butterflies that occur, 
So yeah, it was a little bit of nervousness. But Boogaloo was constantly telling me, he's like, you know, yeah, you're gonna come out, you're gonna see the crowd, you're gonna hear the crowd, and yeah, you don't have butterflies initially. He said, but I can assure you, when that bell rings, all of those feelings will be gone and you'll be locked and loaded on your opposition. And so it did occur just as he said. Um, I had been blessed in my amateur career um, training at the police athletic league. We had some of the best amateurs uh, in the country that I trained along with. And um, world champion boxers. I, I mean, I was in there and I was sparring with Buster Drayton, the former IBF junior middleweight champion. So um, I had a lot of amateurs that were advanced, well advanced over me who were working, that were essentially groomed me in my amateur career, which prepped me, well prepped me for my professional conversion. So what I was saying is by the time I get in there and I get in there with this four-round execution, if you want to call it, I said, I'll be well prepared for whatever they're going to bring to the table. And it was and occurred exactly as that. Um, when I bell rung, I, I got right into war zone and um, executed everything as it should have gone. I mean, it, it felt like a sparring session to me. And, and anybody that has had a sparring session with me, if you had a sparring session with me, you know exactly what I mean. Um, and so I went through and I executed very well and got this guy out of there, I think with a third round KO as a result of my body shots um, it ended the fight. And it felt very good. No butterflies or nothing. It felt good. Hey. Now, you touched on a couple of things there, uh, and what I'm actually going to do now is, is skip forward a little bit in time, because um, you won, I think you were 14-0, uh, I think it was, when you first met Robert Thomas, and you obviously you had the two, um, correct me if I'm wrong about the 14-0, the but, uh, you know, you got to that point, and obviously you had the two losses to him that were, you know, back-to-back, -back, but you bounced back uh, and you kept going. And one of the things I, I like about your career is there's been, a, you know, a number of times where you've had hurdles, um, for want of a, a better word, and you've bounced back and you've overcome them. Um, so, uh, you know, and you've got a lot of heart in that way, which is where, where I'm going with this. But those two losses to, um, to Robert Thomas, uh, a few, like I say, a few fights on now from, from your debut. Um, how did you bounce back from that? I mean, how did you keep your confidence in yourself and, sort of keep going with your career after that point? Well, me mentally, um, the thing about boxing that I had grown to recognize, realize, learn, love, and respect was, um, it, it, to me, it posed a challenge mentally. And I mean mentally because the way I see it is, for me, even having to come into a gym when it is possibly 100 degrees outside, put on my equipment to sweat and get grimy and spar somebody that's possibly at least 20, 25 pounds heavier than me, and then having to try and not have this person that probably is a bit stronger than me, you know, put the pressure and weight and everything strength against me and try to use every thing I can think of mentally and physically to try to overcome the speed and power for a matter of five or six rounds. That challenge that faced me daily was the same mindset that I brought into the ring when I fought. Um, adversity, I think I handled it very well. Um, losses to Greg Thomas 
were business, the way I view that, they were business five losses. Boxing was, he did nothing to me. He didn't, he didn't touch my heart, my mind, my skill set. By those were political losses. Those yeah. were business losses. Um, any and everybody that had been present at those fights, the the rematch, my goodness, it was on national TV. I'm like, come on, you know. So it was one of those things. I'm like, okay, I see what's going on here. I see what's taking place. He knows he damn sure didn't beat me. Um, I mean, dude, you, I threw twice as many punches to every one punch you threw. I might have thrown four or five to every one punch that he may have thrown. So um, it was a learning curve for me as well in boxing, which was another thing that inspired me to continue on going because with those losses that were given to me, I was so determined to show the world that I was much more better than this. And mentally, where and probably most fighters would have been broken, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> this did nothing but just create a monster. That's what it did. And it was actually up to that point. If, if you look at and follow my fights and my boxing style up to those 14 fights, you'll notice that I was much more of a boxer I, as opposed to, you know, holding my ground and wanting to exchange punches and become combative, I would much more wanted to box, use the rein, you know, set things up with the jab, you know, and go from that point. After those two losses, the way that I felt was like this. You know what? I was like, you know what? I'm giving boxing my absolute all. And the way I looked at it, it was giving me its ass to kiss. And I was like, you know what I'm going to do? From this point forward, I'm going to kick as long as I see ass. And my training mentality went, man, it went through the roof. I mean, in the gym itself, I was like, I'm going to commit myself even much more. I said, I'm going to become more dominant. That point, in time with my boxing career, Boogaloo Watts is known as a well skilled boxer. Charles Brewer can be that boxer, but more importantly, I would rather tie fire to your ass than be a boxer. So, what ended up happening was even with the instructions that were coming from Boogaloo. Um, he wanted me at that time to be much more of a boxer. My mindset was, you know what? I did that. I gave it the boxing. You know, I, I brought the boxing ability to the table, and they 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 snuffed me. You know, I'm like they took two fights from me from using the jab. And I said, no. What I'm gonna do is. I'm going to make sure I'm going to win these fights. I'm going to be the living hell out of my opposition. And they won't have no questions about whether or not I won this fight or not. And the way that I had began training in the gym, um, it just, it, 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 it was an overnight change, man. I had begun becoming a lot more aggressive. I mean, man. Wow. If you can only see what, I, what I'm saying. The deal, and it's crazy, it, just to be able to see how I used to work out and train, any and everybody I have experience being in the gym with me will tell you, and I, I lie to you not. People that I, and it's funny when I hear it from other boxers now, when they talk about the person that I was in the gym, but um, that mindset changed completely. So. But those two losses that were given to me by Greg Thomas, we knew what was happening. Um, at the time, by the way, I was signed with top rank. Um, and so with those two losses being given to me, top rank essentially was saying bye-bye to me. 
and that was fine. Okay, it was a lesson learned. Um, but I know as well as many of people that have kept up with my career that those losses that were given to me wasn't legitimate losses, and you know those were the first two losses that had been given. There were quite a few more that occurred in my boxing career that we, I'm sure that we're going to get into shortly. But yeah, um, they turned the tables for me. And so from those two losses with Robert Thomas, essentially I think the hatchet himself was born. Yes, I've been a hatchet since the first day I turned pro, but in all trueness, the action, the acting that you saw in that ring, inside that ring, that was truly the hatchet that began showing himself after those two losses. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I understand what you mean, and even the fact that you bounced back uh, so quickly with um, the knockout over Willie Harris, uh, I mean, it goes to show. There's another thing there that, that um, I was actually going to cover later, but I'll, I'll cover it now instead, which is, you know, you're known for being very, very dedicated and uh, during your career. And obviously, I know you, you just explained with, with Robert Thomas, that, um, with Greg Thomas, that that, expl that that changed at a point and you got more dedicated and everything. But what was the main thing that, you know, kept you motivated in your, in your boxing career for all the years that you were boxing? Um, and I know that that's a bit of a strange one, but your primary motivation, obviously, you wanted to be champion, obviously, you were champion, and, and we'll get to that. But was it to prove people wrong? Was it to be the best? Was it, do you know what I mean? I mean, for different guys, it's, it's different things. What sort of made you tick as, as a boxer um, on a mental level, if that makes sense? Good question. Now, let me explain this to you. Well, probably at this point in this stage now, if probably a lot of the newer, younger fighters aren't aware of it. But aside from me being a boxer, at one point in time, early on in my career, I was also a uh, computer professional, which at that time was completely, it was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, you do what? Like, people used to, you know, I, I was a, um, I was a data analyst, and so, People that I work with in the in the, in, <laughs> in the white collar environment would look at me and they're like, "You don't look like a boxer, you know." I, I come to work and I a certain town and well dressed and I'm able to sit down and I start programming. And <laughs> five o'clock comes, I go to the gym, I get sweaty, and that person that comes in comes out in the gym and starts working out is a complete animal. And so I had the people that were in the boxing world see me and say, I understand your background, meaning you're able to be a professional and do that and do this. Nobody from the IT world can understand, like, how in the hell do you do that? After a whole day of doing this, and I'm, I'm like, it's all mental. You know, for me, it, it was all mental. Um, I was just driven mentally by the challenge. Again, I can't emphasize that enough, by the challenge that boxing placed to me. Another thing, um, <laughs> I'm not an avid boxing fan. I <laughs> no means. And it's crazy because I even said it to myself. Now and I laugh. I'm like, you know, I I love this sport, hand over fist. Um, you know, I can watch a fight, see what each fighter brings to the table, and be able to dictate and, and determine. Mm, yeah, this guy's probably gonna win. I mean, knowing that at any given time, this is a sport of boxing, and a punch, one punch, can determine the outcome. Again, still what's being shown initially, what skill sets may be present, may not. 
I'm like, yeah, it, it don't interest me or I'll just lose I'll lose all interest in them, believe it or not. So what kept me going was, man, it it, it was just that drive. That inner drive. Like I said, I, I fell in love with the sport of boxing. I love the mental and physical challenge that boxing brought to me. I loved it. I mean, and I, I don't have – if it wasn't been – if it had not been for me acquiring an injury at a young age, because at 14, when I first met Boogaloo as well, started training with Boogaloo. I was playing a pickup game of football on the streets, and I ended up, as a result, dislocating my head. As a result, so um, early on in my career, and we're talking about my amateur career, I'm like, I'm 14 years old. I dislocated my head um, from playing football, but football unto itself, and, and now wow. I look at it sometimes and say, yeah, that, that that saved me because I ended up running into boxing and, and ended up becoming the hatchet and so on and so forth. But football, to me, was a sport that I ended up actually loving the most. That was a sport that I actually loved. But, um, again, I had gotten that connection with boxing, and, wow, man, that just went crazy. I, I loved it. And so... Um, I think me being introduced to the sport, the challenge, mental, and more so the mental, and I can't say just the physical challenge because mentally you got to have it upstairs to be able to say, okay, it's 100 degrees outside, and uh, I got to run today. Do I feel like getting up, going outside when it's 100 degrees and putting in five miles or so? It's there to be answered, and you got to do it. So I, I love the sport for the challenge that it brought to me and it brings to me mentally and physically, and it essentially made me the person that I am today, man, when it comes to boxing. Amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing insight into, you know, the other side of, um, you know, the fighter's mentality that a lot of people yeah. don't see. Yeah. Following on from that, I mean, um, we, you know, we, we've got to go there now. Obviously, moving ahead, you know, a few more fights. When you won the world title, um, you know, and when that actually happened for you, um, let's talk about that experience um, on, I mean, there's a few different levels, you know, we could talk about that. But um, for starters, um, what was the preparation like for it? And as well as that, when you actually won, what was the experience? I know it's two sides, like two sides to that question, but let's start with the preparation um, for the world title fight itself. Um, we had gotten, I had gotten to the point where I had become the number one contender. Well, let me get this straight. <laughs> Leading, coming up in the rankings, uh, I was at the number two spot by the IDF, and um, Roy Jones at the time was the world champion. Now, I always had a thing for Roy Jones and had gotten the opportunity and chance to actually meet him and told him, I'm like, Roy, you, you know, I told him, I, I said, man, I am and was a fan of yours but man, I want some of your ass bad. And it, it was sincere. He, he was the man that I wanted. I, want, I wanted to fight him bad. And so, you know, I had worked my way up to number two contender. Um, I've been given the opportunity to challenge for the number one spot. <clears throat> and when I did that, you know, I had acquired the USBA Super Middleweight Championship, and so <clears throat> that put me right at the top. And I'm like, at that point, I'm like, yes, uh, I'm there. You know, I'm like, okay, the fight with Jones is on. Well, <laughs> come to find out Roy Jones, I ended up making the decision to move up the light heavyweight, and the Super Middleweight title was now being vacated. 
and spell was going to be a person, Gary Bowlett, that was going to challenge me for the vacant title. <clears throat> well, the way I felt was <laughs> Gary Bowlett could have stayed his ass home on that day because <laughs> and there was going to be no one on the face of this earth that was going to stop me from becoming a world champion on that day when I, when I won that title. And so um, the preparation for it, um, without trying to continually have the focus so locked and loaded on the fight with the championship, on the belt, fighting for the belt, it, it didn't change much. I always trained hard. Um, at that time, we had um, Buster Drayton, who was the IBL junior middleweight champion. So, um, you know, we're in, I, I train normally with these guys every day. And so it was just the thing of getting into that mindset, um, preparing myself more mentally. Physically, I, I was straight. I, to man, I'm like, I was like an a, a army soldier, you know, when it came to, you know, being completely prepared physically, um, I was there. Mentally, it was just some things I needed to tighten up on. How becoming a world champion did and was going to change my life. And wow, it's funny. It, it, I tell you, it's an experience that you would have to experience to understand what I'm saying, to be able to say, if I could only go back to that day when I should have did this, I should have said this, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have done that. Um, but in preparation for the fight itself, I was game, I was ready to execute. And um, having seen what Gary Ballard was going to bring to the table, I was like, um, I can't wait to go there to get that belt placed right around my, my waist because he, he's not going to last. And I was successful in doing so and ended up getting, getting him out of there relatively soon. You know, that does lead to the other, um, the other side of that question is, is when you won, um, I mean, what was it like? I mean, I, I know you say that, you know, you have to have the experience. And in all fairness, I've heard that from um, other, you know, world champions I've worked with and everything but if you could give a little bit of an insight into what did it feel after all those years of hard work and everything to, to actually mm -hmm. get there it was one of the most gratifying feelings i have ever had in my life um it it was wow i mean in terms of life's accomplishments it was like at the present moment in time that was it. It was like out of all the thousands, hundreds, and possibly hundreds of thousands of fighters out here that are challenging to want to become a contender, let alone a world champion, I did it. I made it to the top of the mountain. Um, and I, I, you know, it was such a immense feeling of gratitude, like, oh my God, I actually made it. I'm the man, you know, like I did it. Um, it was a challenge, man, because coming up within those that year or so, I lost my mom. And I lost my mom around the time that I had become the USBA champion. And where with some people, it might have torn them apart, <clears throat> and it definitely, absolutely, positively did to a point with me. I channeled that loss into a motivating factor and used the inspiration to just draw me straight to the top. It was like, okay, my arm's no longer here to guide me. And I just felt as though all that negative energy that's trying to come about, I'm going to channel it and I'm going to use all that love that I know that she once had for me. 
I'm going to drive myself straight to the top. And then, and that's that was the only way that I saw it. It was like, it's something that you got to do. It's something that you owe her. And so it was that that was it, man. It, it drove me. as was like, I can't be stopped at this point in time. And that's the way I felt. That's truly the way I felt, man. It was like everything that I had been exposed to in that sport business to that point, even with, you know, like you're talking about the losses, the Gregory Thomas and all, and the business losses, things of that nature, was like, I'm there. I, I ended up becoming a world champion, not him, as a result. And I felt good, very good, man. Um, yeah, just, just taking it all in. That's an amazing description of it, uh, that's all. Let's talk about um, a few of your defenses. Um, in particular, I mean, I'd like to talk about your world title defense uh, at the Blue Horizon. I, uh, you know, I mentioned that venue earlier. Um, because as I understand it, you're the only world champion to defend uh, your title there. So, I mean, what was that experience like, you know, um, being world champion, being, as you say, being top of the mountain and, you know, defending at an absolutely historic uh, and legendary boxing venue, obviously known around the country, but known around the world, really. Uh, I mean, what was it like to, you know, have that experience? Uh, I mean, it was packed out in there for starters. You know, did you, did you expect that? And what was the whole experience like? Yeah, it, it, at, at that point in time um, in my career, Charles Braun, my name being mentioned as being a fight on any card at the Blue Horizon, I was sell the plates out instantly. Um, but upon me becoming world champion, um, Russell Peltz, who ended up becoming my promoter, um, ended up we ended up having a meeting with me and my trainer and um, manager. And he said, well, what do you think about having the first world championship fight at the Blue Horizon? And I was like, whoa, I was like, for real? I was like, that would be lovely. I said, they, I said yeah, that, that would be, that would really be good. The one thing that we had to work out, of course, was the financials of it. <laughs> and so um, we did that. And, you know, well, I know I was satisfied, but uh, it was just a matter of them saying, you know, get, get the opponent, um, get a contender, and let's do it. You know, let's make history. And so, and, and that was the other thing for me. It was... I'm going to do something. It essentially was for my Philadelphia fans, but also was something that was going to be done historically because it was never done before. Uh, yeah, we've had former world champions fight there, but nobody had ever defended a title that was a, cha that was a champion at the present point in time at the Blue Rise. So I was like, yo, this is going to be a good one for me. So, yes, um, I was definitely game to go ahead and, and and have that fight made. It turned out being one of the best fights in my career, man. It, it really did. It really did. And that's worth mentioning as well, champ. I mean, um, if you had to pick, like, the proudest moment of your career. I mean, I'd imagine it was probably becoming world champion, but you never assume these things. It might have been something else. Um, what was what was the proudest moment? Was it the world title win? Was it, uh, you know, that defense at the Blue Horizon? Was it something else? Uh, you know, the, the moment for you, or it, maybe there's more than one. Um, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Let me, let me tell you this. Okay, so I've been asked, you know, from different people from time to time, who or what was my most complex fight that I might have had? Was it Kawasaki? It's, um, you know, I'm like, mm, no, not actually. Me becoming a world champion, first and foremost, from where I grew up and the hardships that may have come along with life from the neighborhood that I came up in and grew up in, 
that goal of becoming a world champion in the sport of boxing unto itself was a major accomplishment in life, period. So that supersedes everything. Um, yes, I was so glad to be able to put on that show for my family, which I consider Philadelphia, um, and defend my title at home. Absolutely. The most complex <laughs> fight that I may have had and, and it could pose on you mentally and physically. It was in Atlantic City when I fought against Hal Graham, who was a very crafty southpaw who, uh, in the third round, had put me on a canvas with a straight left hand. And man, let me tell you something. <laughs> for, for those that don't know, um, that was one of and, and listen, I hadn't had a problem particularly with softballs at all. And you know, and I couldn't make the adjustment to them and and be able to pick up the speed and be able to count a song and so forth. It was just at that point in time something about this guy's style. He caught me with a very good shot. I went down. What people don't realize happened. I tore, tore three ligaments in my left ankle as we were all doing so. My right ankle, sorry. When I did that, I'm fighting a softball, very crafty softball. I am an orthodox, I am a, a orthodox fighter. And I'm having to put the weight on my right foot upon which I tore ligaments in against this crafty southpaw. This guy's dancing all around the ring. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't barely move because my right ankle is, is killing me. And this guy's just throwing all kinds upon that. But I was so gang, I was so much into it, I, kept, I said to myself, when I catch this guy, with this punch that I've been practicing and practicing and practicing on in preparation for that fight, which was a right hook, because I saw that in the video that I had been watching of him, that was one shot that I had the chance of catching him with. And my goodness, <laughs> that opportunity came in the 10th round of that fight, and when I caught him, it was over. I hit him with that shot that one time, and it damn near knocked him out the ring. And I followed up on him, and he actually ended up falling to the canvas and grabbing the referee's legs and wrapping his arms around the legs of the ref and having the fight being halted. That fight unto itself was probably more mentally, definitely physically challenging than any fight that I had I ever had in my career. And that was probably the highlight of, if you want to call it, comebacks for me doing it in my career, man. That, that guy, and I, you know, I told her, I said, man, you were the hardest to challenge and fight that I've had in my entire career. And the reason being is because, yes, one, you were a very crafty individual. Um, your style was uh, agitating more than anything. And your stuffer who caught me with a good shot and had me injure my right ankle, which, come on, man, if I'm a softball and you're orthodox, or you're a softball and I'm an orthodox, I need to depend on my right ankle to be able to throw that right hand and put the weight from my right hand. So I always mention that and say, you know, up to that point in my career, that was the action. That was definitely one of the highlights. And of course, yes, yes, yes. Joe Calzaghe as well was one of the major highlights of my career as well. I'm sure you want to ask me about that. Well, yes, I, you know, <laughs> uh, that's something I was going to ask next is obviously, yeah, because I'm from basically the Cardiff area and everything. And, 
you know, you've been here when you fought Joe Kalzaki and everything like that. I mean, there's there's quite a bit. Um, and I'm sure, like, obviously, the you know the Welsh and the British fans watching this will be very interested in that, um, even though everything we've talked about is is really interesting. So, yeah, let's talk about Joe Kalzaki. I mean, first and foremost, though, I'd like to ask you, what was your actual experience like uh, coming to Wales, you know, coming to my country, basically? Um, and what was... Um, what was that like? And then we'll talk about the the fight itself. Yeah, it, it, um, I got a very warm, warm welcome to the country. Um, for the most part, I was somewhat surprised at how much the sport of boxing is accepted in England, London. But my trainer Bo had already told me because he had been there before, and. He had told me as well, it's the boxing is big in London. And, and, and so it is. And I was getting a lot of guys that, that I didn't know Kyle Zaggy had that many people that were going against him. I was like, we had guys that were telling me, he's going to go go over there and we want you to kick his ass. I'm like, wow. I'm like, really? I'm like, okay. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but it, it, you know, the, the, the environment itself, the gyms, man, it, it was history for me. It was, it was a very good visit. Um, I was surprised more so than anything, but, um, it, I mean, it was a great opportunity for me to get the exposure that I had gotten being over there. It, it, it was a good place to be. So I I was really surprised though at some of the uh, some of the oh my goodness some of the motivational advice that I was getting from some of the guys from some of the clubs and places I was like oh my goodness like them guys wanted me to kill Calvary I'm like wow I was like oh my goodness okay okay so it was different definitely. Different experience, yeah. And then, what about the fight itself? Um, I mean, how you know what? What's your opinion on um, you know your performance and you know how the fight went and just the whole dynamic of that, really? All right, here's the way that I went. When initially the name Joe Calzaghe had come up um, and was having me talked about as being the challenger for his title. I didn't know who he was. I had never heard of Kyle Zaggy. Um it was after the what's his name? Um, the fighter that it was after a fight that I had had him he was in the United States that I should have won but I did. So um the talks of a Kyle Zaggy fight had begun coming through the wire and my manager was saying to me, um, oh, I know, it was Antoine Eccles. And for those that can remember the fight that I had with Antoine Eccles, that fight hadn't been stopped in the manner that it was stopped. Ah. <laughs> um, that fight was to determine who was going to be the challenger for Kyle Zag. Unfortunately, the way that the fight the outcome of the fight, which had me losing, apparently Calzaghi's people saw the fight and was like, no, we want a bro. And, and so a few months afterwards, the negotiation, I got in the call, the negotiation came about for the fight to be taking place between me and Calzaghi. And again, like I had said, I never heard, I didn't know who Calzaghi was. So <clears throat> when it comes out and I get the word that I'll be fighting Joe Calzaghe, and early on I'm hearing he's going to knock me out. So I was like, I went to my manager and I'm like, does he know who the hell I am? And I said, he's going to knock me out. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? So I began looking up video of him and 
I didn't say anything special about him. Um, to me, it seemed like he was just a fast hand slapper for the most part. And, you know, and so I, you know, I took it for what it's worth. I said he was a softball and pretty fast hand, but I don't see, he, to me anyway, he doesn't have devastating power by no means. Nothing that's going to keep me, um, you know, defensive minded for 12 rounds. And so the preparation for the Joe Calzaghe fight came about. Um, I prepared well for it, was ready and game for the fight itself. <clears throat> One of the things I got to tell you is, is that if nothing else, I had to shake Calzaghe's hand. That joker, he gave me a fight. I mean, man, and I'm sure you're all well aware. You look at that fight. His father was cursing him out. My trainer was screaming and cursing me out because we was in there thumping. I mean, I mean, we gave we gave the boxing world a fight to see on that night when we fought. Um, and I, I could do nothing more than just, you know, hug and congratulate him on his victory. If there was a fight to say that I lost and be able to go along with, that would be it. I'm like, okay, dude, tonight you were the better athlete. You won this fight. And, but we were thumping. We, <laughs> us two, we gave, we gave Showtime the fight that they were looking for on that evening. Um, not only that, though, two years later, I had met up with Calzaghe in New York. He gave me tickets to the fight with him and Roy Jones. And, you know, again, that was, you know, a gratuitous type thing to be done for that as well. One thing I will say, though, I, I, I believe I need to say about <clears throat> Cal Zaggy, I personally think that I gave him a better fight than both Roy Jones and Bernard Hopkins gave him. I, and I always wanted to ask him, so if you get the chance to ask him that, ask him, do you think Charles Burrow gave you a better fight than both Roy Jones and Bernard Hopkins? And he beat the shit out of Roy. I get and you know Bernard to not maybe not well definitely not as bad, but he beat him. He outboxed him, he outclassed and skilled him. I think personally that I gave him a more a more defined challenge than either one of them had given him. And and I always wanted to he's not a social media type like person, so I, I hadn't been able to reach out directly to him to actually ask the question of him would I have been that person that had given him that particular challenge? But um, I think so. I, I think, you know, given I understand, I do understand both Roy, well, for that matter, <laughs> both me. Bernard and Roy, neither one of us was on our prom, number one. So he caught all of us at the perfect time in our career, the fighter. Um, I was, what, 30, 32? Uh, I know yeah. Bernard was older, and I know Roy was older. So, but nevertheless, and he was one of, one of the more highlights, definite highlights of my career, one of the more challenging fights that I engaged in during my career as well. That's a really good insight, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll see what I can do to find out, um, you know, what he thinks of that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, so yeah, I mean, moving on from that now, I mean, there's, there's a few more questions I have that are a bit more sort of, um, well, what you could call general interest, and what I mean by that is it a bit broader. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is, um, if you had to say to you know, young boxers, people who are just getting into the sport uh, of boxing, you know, maybe they're um, just in their amateur career, just starting out, maybe they're just, just turning professional, anything like that. Um, one or two things that are key to 
succeed in in the sport and again i was going to ask you this later but um i, I want to ask you now because it sort of for me it ties into what you said about joe what what would you actually say i mean you're doing everything that you've done and um you know everything like that what would be maybe one or two things that you'd say are essential for for success in boxing um one of the main things that i would um pass on to a, a, a young fighter you know what's funny because my son is actually in boxing. I know. I, I'd like to talk about that as as well, but um, yeah. And, yeah. and and the thing about water boxing and how I feel about it is, just as I told my son, I said, "Listen, you say that you want to be a boxer, and I would talk to any youth as well. You want to be a boxer." I want you to get this through your mind right now. You can step in that ring, but be carried out literally. And that, that goes to say that if you're going to engage in boxing, take it serious, very serious. Because that first punch could be the last punch. And for me personally, um, that's exactly how I, I take boxing. Um, I have seen guys get hurt. I personally have hurt guys. I was 14 years old, man, and I had a crew of guys that were working with me, that trained in the gym along with me. 14 years old, it was around the time when I first met with both of them. I'm sparring a guy, a, a friend of mine in the ring. I hit this guy with a left foot, and I knocked him unconscious with his eyes wide open. You talking about my heart, man, my heart almost dropped to my toes. I, it scared the shit out of me. And I'm looking, and I'm like, oh, my God, what did I do, you know? I hit him with a left hook, he, and I, I dropped him. And he was unconscious with his eyes open. And from that point forward, I was like, man, I, I literally, I'm standing in the middle of the ring, I'm looking at my hands. And I'm like, yo, I did this. And I'm looking at both of them, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like man, this is, this is real. And so... When you talk about the sport of boxing and the accomplishments that you want to make and things that you want to do, and like, listen, first and foremost, you need to understand what you're signing up for. But that's first and foremost. And I, and I told my son that, and I told him that from day one. Like, uh, we're going to make this play right here now. And you think that this is going to be easy, you got the wrong sport, and I'm not wasting my time. And you're going to be involved with the sport of boxing. Be first and foremost, mentally, mentally, man, you have got to be committed. And I'm like, you don't understand what I mean by mentally because you got to understand that, yes, I'm your father. And I told him this as well. I said, yes, I'm your father. Don't look at it that way. Because the person that you're going to be done with when it comes to boxing is the hatchet. And he understand what I mean by that. I'm like, Dad's here. Yeah, he's here. But when it comes to you getting inside that ring, I'm going to express myself just as if you are my opposition. I'm going to try to light your ass up. I want you – it's going to be a totally different way of being that I'm going to present myself to you when it comes to this sport. You have to understand and realize that you can't and don't, shouldn't and won't. Do not play boxing. It does not work. You do not play boxing. If you do, your ass is going to be unsuccessful. I'm going to tell you that now. And so, you know, the words for me going to the youth that's coming up that want to do this, it is – Mentally, if you can become committed to it, and if you're mentally committed to it, physically it's going to be a cakewalk because in your mind, if this is truly what you want to do, 
and what you want to be, mentally you're going to act that out. It shouldn't be a challenge. It shouldn't be a challenge for you to want to go into the gym. But you have to commit the uh, condition yourself to want to get out and go running and eat right and, and do all the things necessary to become successful in the sport of boxing. You'll do it naturally. But don't waste your time. And you definitely ain't going to waste my time if, uh, if that's not the case. So that for me is the main thing. You know, I, I take boxing very, very serious. I don't, I never did. I never played boxing at all. Advice. It's very, very good advice. Um, that's all I can say to that. Um, just on a personal note, uh, you know, obviously having been around boxing in the media side of it, uh, you still see, you know, a lot of what goes on. And I say it's, it's, it's very, very good advice. Which does lead me to your son, um, Charles Jr., you know, boxing, and he's sort of setting out and um, following in your footsteps. And um, that's, that's another question that I have, actually. Um, what are your aspirations there? Obviously, he had a successful debut um, earlier in the year, earlier this year, January. Uh, and he's and I know things are a bit on hold at the moment with this lockdown and stuff. But when that's over, um, you know, what are your aspirations with him? Uh, what you know, what are his aspirations? And uh, let, I mean, let's talk a little bit about that. So, so you're actually training him. Uh, that's right, yeah. isn't it? You're actually yes, yeah, so you're training him. So he's looking to build up the record and get going, basically. You know what? The, the funny thing about it is. Um, and, and I told him this before he even turned pro, or for that matter, before he, <laughs> when he started boxing. Um, I, I told him, and I got some of the people that know knew me through boxing, that there's always going to be that comparison between him and me, both that neither one of us have any control of, which is to say, are you going to be the second coming of the Hatchby? And I told him, I said, you're going to get this all the time. I have nothing to do with it. You're not going to have any control on it. But they're going to think that when they see you, they're saying me. Your style is going to present a whole different perspective of boxing probably probably as opposite of mine. He's a little bit more, a little bit more of a boxer, but definitely has the aggressiveness of Charles Brewer. Um, and he is a softball. So <laughs> that's that's the major change right there. But um I told him, you know, the good thing about it He's, he's athletic, so he's already athletic. I mean, he played on the football team in high school. He ran, he's one of the, the he broke records on the track team um, in his high school. So he, he's already an athlete. He's already got that athletic mindset. So in terms of him being committed to the sport of boxing and the physical part, there's no conversation needed there. He got that covered. The mental part is more so something that I, I may have to get on his back at times just to say, come on, we, we can work through this. Don't worry about it. I, I got this. You know, so I'm sure there's going to come a point in time where there's going to be a, a mental challenge that he's going to have maybe – concern a fight or a, you know, sparring session that I may have to, you know, go the route of guiding him through. But again, <clears throat> just as I had good guys, more knowledgeable guys for that matter, with me coming up through my career, I put him in the ring with some top tier pros with him starting off right away. So I've already put him in the ring with guys, you know, that, like Jesse Hart and um, Hank, um, 
But um, I, I've already had him in the ring with some top tier, top tier professionals to prepare him for what is to come in the sport of boxing, bro. So I feel confident in him, you know, and we're going to take it one step at a time. But I can't wait to get out this damn quarantine and get back in the gym, though. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, you know, champ, I mean, you know, we've covered um, an absolute multitude of stuff there. Um, and it's it's better, again, than what I hoped for in the, in the sense that as much as we've talked about the fights, um, you know, we've talked about the mental side and we've talked about other sides as well. Um, and, you know, I'm very happy. I mean, I know we, we skipped over um, Sven Oke in there. We you skipped over him, but I, I'm not too worried about that, to be honest, because we, we got the highlights of you winning and uh, the world title, which is more, you know, more, more what I was interested in. Um, I mean, you know, before we sort of, wrap it up because I, I you know i've i've covered everything I, I was after are there other things that you'd like to talk about is there anything anything else that you'd like to sort of discuss um in particular that comes to mind uh, or maybe anything you'd like to say to the fans anything you'd like to say to people watching this um not a whole lot nothing other than i guess for the most part <clears throat> um the sport of boxing has been very good to me, you know, throughout my hardship that may have occurred throughout my career. Overall, man, for the people that I have been blessed to be encompassed by, um, man, the places I have seen, the things I have seen, it's been nothing more than an absolute blessing for me. Um, it has definitely been an experience. And you know, I'm very grateful for that. Um, you know, in boxing, yes, it is a very difficult sport. I don't, you know, tend to make it seem as though it's a cakewalk. No. But if if you can commit yourself more so mentally, because if mentally you're not gonna be in it to to think what you're gonna need to have to go through day in and day out. Physically, you're not going to be a bad figure. It's, it's a fight loss already. So with that being said, man, I'm, I'm just so grateful for the people that I have come about to be able to meet, the places I have visited, man. I mean, I've been all over the world. I'm grateful to have been able to see the world, um, to see that the neighborhood that I may have grew up and come from is only one small, very small fraction of what exists in this world itself, you know, and that there are people from all areas of the world, man, that are truly fans of Charles Brewer, and I'm very grateful to see that. Um, that and the accomplishments, the achievements that I have made myself, then I'm sure that at one point in time, I myself may have thought I could never be there. Somebody would have saw, said this to me at a young age, that, you know, one day you're going to be such and such. I'd probably be like, you must be crazy. You're talking to the wrong person. And having to have turned out to accomplish the things that I had in the sport of boxing, and when the sport is over and done with, the awards that I have received and the inductions or Hall of Fame and things and such that I have been inducted into as a result of my commitment to the sport, man, like, come on. Like, wow. I, 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 I look back on this now and I'm like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> I actually did it. And there are a lot of people just as you ask me, what would I say to the youths out there I myself say I am one of those individuals who are hand over fist able to walk into practically any boxing gym and be able to instruct a fighter on what they're doing, how they're doing, and they would respectfully want to listen to what I'm saying because they know and can trust 
that I am giving them good advice. So that into itself as well, I feel good about that. Couldn't say anything less about it, but I feel good about that. Amazing. Absolutely, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Well, Champ, all I can say is it's it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I mean, you know, we, we've covered so much, uh, and I know there's more again, that, you know, that, that we, we could could have covered, but we've covered so much, uh, and it's been absolutely, it's been fantastic insights, um, you know, into your career, into your life, mindset, um, you know, future plans, just so many things. Um, and like I said to you before, I mean, I'm I'm very, very grateful um, for you taking the time to talk with me today. I, you know, I'd really, really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Not a problem at all, man. It's, you know, it's funny now that I have to look back and talk about the person that I once was. And, it, it, you know, to myself, I often laugh a lot when I, when I sit back and mentally I think about even going into a gym and just wanting to work out and try executing some of the things that I once was able to do. And I'm like, nah, I think I'll pass this one up. <laughs> like, nah, I think, I, I think I'll do this another time. I've been there and I've done that. So I don't have, you know, it's funny because I often, from time to time with my son, you know, I'll, I'll see him doing certain exercises and things of such, and I'll tell him about how I used to do it and how it would make you feel, and he'll be smiling, like, well, why don't you go ahead and show me, Dad? Go ahead. And I'm like, uh, okay, I've already done what you're talking about. I've been there and I've done it. I don't need to show you now. But um, I'm, I'm glad to have... have Accomplished what I have, man, and I feel good with it. I feel definitely, absolutely good with my accomplishment. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel, and there'll be more videos coming soon.